All right, so we're going to be talking next about engaging the value chain from ingredients to retailers. And our moderator for this session is going to be Victoria Parr. Victoria is the business development director uh, for Vera Maris. Uh, and I think a lot of you already know Vera Maris is one of the handful of companies that uh, make substitutes for fish oil. They won our second uh, F3 uh, challenge. Uh, someplace I've got a picture of me giving uh, Vera Maris their, their uh, $200,000 check. My kids are still trying to figure out where that came from, why my signature was on it, but um, giving away their inheritance. Uh, so Victoria's been in seafood for nearly a decade, works throughout the value chain with retailers, distributors, NGOs, farmers, feed mills, and she's gonna be sharing the features and advantages, benefits of Vera Maris's natural marine oil. So welcome Victoria, and I'll let you introduce the panel. Hi, everybody. Welcome back for lunch, from lunch. We're gonna do something fun. We're gonna like jazz this up a little bit, so play along with me. We're gonna do a little tongue twister. And the panel is gonna participate on microphones. Ready? Repeat after me. Repeat after me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pheasant plucker. I'm a, I'm a pheasant, pheasant, pheasant plucker. plucker. I pluck mother pheasants. I, I pluck, pluck mother, mother pheasants. pheasants. I'm the most pleasant mother pheasant plucker that ever plucked a mother pheasant. <laughs> I'm the I'm most pleasant, pleasant mother, mother, mother pheasant, pheasant plucker that ever plucked a mother pheasant. This is really tough for a dyslexic person. <laughs> okay, now we're all awake. <laughs> we're all awake. This is an amazing group. I am so honored to not only be with this panel, but to be with all of you. Uh, innovation, ideas, how we're gonna save the world. I, I, I'm a believer. I, I'm grateful for F3. We um, at Veramaris leaned on our F3 win really hard. It was really important. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Emma. You have been amazing wherever you are. I can't, I can't see you there you are. Um, I think the message that I'm taking from this experience is that together uh, we, can, we can work together and make this a really great thing. Um, Kevin and the team have asked me to talk about how we scaled up. Um, a lot of people working their butt off in, in Nebraska is, is one answer to that. A lot of people doing certifications everywhere, all over the world to, to get our ingredient accepted. We just recently, after three years, were accepted in, in Canada. And that, that, was, that was a really big deal for us. The other thing that we did that was unusual is something that has kind of been talked about a little bit here and, and the reason that I've brought all of these lovely people to, to talk to you together, and, and that was we worked throughout the, the value chain. So it was not traditional. It was quite disruptive, and not everyone appreciated it at first. So we had to be what my, my, my friend at, at Walmart calls me per, um, politely persistent. So I just kept asking. My colleagues in Australia, my colleagues in, in, in Europe just kept asking and just kept talking about the features, advantages, and benefits to using our, our algae oil and, and, and how that could help us to stand independent from, from maybe the traditional source of EPA and DHA. So that's how we continue to scale. Um, I, I'm, I'm here to introduce you to these lovely people who are part of that value chain and who interact um, on the daily with, with consumers. And rather than me introduce you, uh, what I would prefer is if you would each introduce yourself, please. 
Thank you so much, Victoria, for having me, uh, for having all of us. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Oliver English. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Common Table Creative. Uh, we are a production company based in Los Angeles, and we focus on telling stories about the future of food. We visit farms all over the world, and our goal and our mission is connected, connecting consumers back to where food grows, how it how it's grown and how it impacts the world around us. So we create short form films, short form content, short form documentaries, and we just released our first feature documentary two months ago on Apple TV and Amazon Prime called Feeding Tomorrow. And we think of ourselves as sort of the top of the funnel. You know, we are creating films and documentaries that connect all of these issues and solutions to regular consumers and inspire them to be part of the change. So it is our great passion to tell stories about the future of food uh, and excited to be with you here today. I've been an advocate for Oliver's film this week. It's fantastic. If anyone's not seen it, it's a strong recommend. It's, it's a really great story. Thanks, Clark. Um, hi, I'm Clark. Uh, I support supply chain and farm operations um, at Seatopia. Uh, Seatopia is building the first truly regenerative seafood supply chain. Um, and we're doing that by selling certified clean, mercury tested, and microplastic free seafood direct to consumer in the States through a distributed network of innovative farm partners around the world. Um, so today, you know, our subscribers and our customers will go to our website, they'll buy either a CSA type box with a mix of fin fish and shellfish, or they can do an a la carte custom, build your own box selecting specific species from farm by name. So we'll work with farms directly, we'll buy products, we'll store it in our own film facilities in Los Angeles and then ship direct to consumer in a corn-based dissolvable insulation, so no styrofoam, ship carbon neutral and reforesting kelp with every order uh, through an awesome partnership with OceanWise. I think we've planted over 6,000 kelp trees in the Northwest. Um, so in addition to sort of telling that consumer message around not only why aquaculture, but how aquaculture, you know, the really exciting thing is what's going on behind the scenes. And that's us working directly with farm partners and ingredient suppliers to commit to purchasing and supporting innovation in aquaculture. So as a brand, we want to use our megaphone, use our buying power, use our ambassador network to bring an increasing number of customers that are willing to vote with their dollars to buy those products at a premium today, now. We're doing that right now. And hopefully, you know, soon we'll get to a point where it's, you know, those prices all come down, but we can be the intermediary step between getting where we need to go and where we're at today by telling people why they should pay more for this and then getting to that point. And that's, I think, what we're really excited about. Thanks, Clark. His, his website's ctopia.fish, by the way. So go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm Maisie Gansler. And I have recently moved from spending 30 years as the chief strategy and brand officer for Bon Appetit Management Company into a strategic advisory role, um, as I have mostly retired but also uh, had a book come out a couple months ago, which Victoria has a copy of. She is my best book seller, um, called You Can't Market Manure at Lunchtime and Other Lessons from the Food Industry and Creating a More Sustainable Company. So I spent the time at Bon Appetit, which is a company that serves about 250 million meals a year at colleges, private corporations, and specialty venues, museums, and a ballpark here or there taking sustainability as our go-to-market differentiator. And I've now written a what I hope is a practical how-to guide to help other companies do the same, to have the dual goals of making real change environmentally or socially, and then also getting market credit for doing so. And your website is? Is MaisieGansler.com. <laughs> and you can blame my parents for that being unspellable. But <laughs> it's, it's in your schedule. You guys have it. Mike? Uh, Mike Tinetti. I'm the CEO at FultonFishMarket.com, uh, which is the uh, e-commerce arm uh, for the Fulton Fish Market. Uh, so uh, for those of you that, that aren't familiar with it, uh, the Fulton Fish Market, it's uh, you know, now uh, 200 uh, plus year old institution. 
uh, founded in 1822. Uh, it's the uh, second largest seafood market in the world uh, and the uh, largest in terms of the variety of species uh, that it carries. And so we're focused on you know, bringing this iconic institution you know, to customers uh, across the U.S. Uh, we switched over to a fully or mostly fully direct-to-consumer model uh, during uh, COVID. And you know, we focus on bringing premium and super premium seafood uh, you know, that customers will find at you know, top Michelin star restaurants you know, right into uh, customers' homes. Uh, and so uh, when we think about uh, the sustainability side, uh, you know, for us, it's uh, you know, quality, 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 uh, you know, super premium seafood first. We find that that's what our customers are really looking for. Uh, and uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, that goes hand in hand with, uh, with what is sustainable. Uh, so we take the angle of we want customers to know that they can feel good about their choices uh, when they shop with us. And we put a lot of uh, our efforts into you know, broader education uh, around sustainability. Uh, so customers can then make you know, decisions based on uh, what's important to them. Uh, but what we you know, constantly hear is you know, over 90% of our customers, the most important thing to them is, is quality, you know, well before price. Uh, you know, price doesn't come in you know, when we run these surveys yeah, it's probably more like 60 to 70 percent. Uh, so, you know, well into uh, second place. Uh, and then a surprising number, uh, you know, I would say more than the average U.S. consumer, uh, you know, about 50 to 60 percent will put sustainability considerations as a top purchase uh, consideration. So, yeah, it's a, a little bit about us and kind of where uh, sustainability fits in for our customers. Thanks, thanks, Mike. I'm, I'm wondering. I'm gonna just pick on you first. Um, how how you were able to make the decision, or how Fulton Fish was able to make the decision to go from the B to B wholesale space to a B to C premium space, and, and and what what motivated you? So one of the questions that has been asked is: Is there a customer for sustainability? Is are they willing to pay more? And so it seems like, based on the folks that are sitting here, the answer could be maybe. So what do you think, Mike? Uh, yeah, for sure. So uh, the, the easy answer to that is uh, you know, when COVID came, uh, the, the restaurants all dried up overnight. Uh, and, and so we had to f find a you know, new way to uh, push, push the business. Um, but you know, I, I think what's you know, more interesting is we really haven't, uh, haven't looked back. You know, we're over 90% uh, direct to consumer, and you know, that's where we intend to uh, continue to play uh, for, you know, for the foreseeable uh, future. And, you know, and that's because we, we have found an audience that, that again, uh, you know, first and foremost, they're just looking for, for great fish. You know, we all know that the U.S. consumer doesn't uh, eat as much seafood as, as we'd like. Uh, and we typically find that it's just having a, a bad experience, you know, not consistently getting that that quality tier uh, that they're looking for. Uh, and you know, part of it too is they uh, they want something that they can trust. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you know the number of customers that are asking, you know, what's in the feed is is probably closer to zero, um, at, at least today. Uh, and that's something you know that I, I think you know. How do we bring customers along this uh, education journey uh, w with us is something that you know we should uh, talk more about and you know uh, ideate on. But uh, you know, it, it's certainly something that's interesting to customers. You know, we get inbounds to customer service. You know, we we do a lot on the site uh, to educate customers as as much as we can around how do how do we think about you know farm versus wild seafood? How do we think about, you know, domestic versus imported? Uh, you know, why we've, uh, why we've partnered with uh, certain brands and certain suppliers uh, to source our seafood. Uh, but it's definitely something that's, that's top of mind. And uh, we haven't had an issue, you know, raising prices when we need to. Uh, if, if customers know that they're getting a, a great quality product, uh, you know, we find that we're able to, you know, pass those 
uh, pass those costs on. And, and that's one thing that I would say is uh, good to think about is it, if you can keep the quality, uh, you know, the trout we had last night, for, for example, was fantastic. And so when you can keep the quality super high, uh, you can bring customers along for the rest of the journey. If you start making the customer make trade-offs uh, on the quality side and, and to a point on, on the price side, you know, that's when things get, get more challenging. Thanks. I, I feel like, Clark, you could just scoop right in there and talk about quality and, and sort of how, how you are not only recruiting a, a demographic that's interested in sustainability and health, but, but also your influencer network, too. Yeah, we, we've gotten some questions recently around you know, how, how have we brought in some of these really high-profile influencers and ambassadors that have been supporting, supporting Zootopia, and I think there's, there's an immediate sort of truth answer to that, and there's a longer, more interesting story. I think the quick truth is that um, these people have, you know, have largely been our customers. And we say this with like a huge amount of gratitude. We haven't, you know, have not been going out or seeking or, or, or paying for these types of partnerships they have found us through the message or through word of mouth or through some of what we've been talking about in, in, in the megaphone around things like algae, algae oil and algae-based feeds, and they buy. Um, and I think part of that is speaking to the point of where we're at now on the sustainability journey and where we're sort of falling down the funnel of exposure and awareness in the broader consumer market. I do not think this would have been the case 10 years ago. I do not think this would have been the case five years ago. I think that a lot has happened, you know, in the restaurant space, the culinary space, what Oliver has been doing. There's a, there's a blueprint now that organic region ag did, and it's perfect. And aquaculture has done a terrible job of telling that story, but the blueprint is there, and we can borrow elements of it we can use the same metaphors. The infographics can be side by side. It makes perfect sense to customers because of the work that I think, that we think ag has been doing alongside for the last 10, 20 years. And so, yes, I, I think people do care about sustainability. It's, it's changed a lot. Um, but our success with influencers and ambassadors is really a testament more to that than anything special that we've done. That, that's a perfect segue to you, Oliver. I mean, you guys have to see his film, it's really good. And it, it, focuses, it focuses on the soil, the relationship between health and humans, and, and how we're going to move, future, uh, move toward the future as a planet together. And it's just really lovely. So I, I'd love to know I'd love to know what was on the cutting room floor because there was so many ideas that were in it and how you were able to streamline such a complex story, actually. Absolutely. Uh, the, cutting, cut, the cutting room floor was pretty brutal uh, over the years. It was originally it was a 12-hour cut and then it ended up being an hour and 18 minutes. Um, and so it was really difficult. And for us, our goal from the very beginning was to tell an interconnected story about how food impacts every part of our lives. Not just to focus on how our food system interacts with the environment, with human health, with society, but to paint an interconnected picture and say, hey, with your food choices, you can have a profoundly negative impact on the environment and human health, or you can have a positive regenerative impact through the food that you eat and the farmers that you support. And so for us, it was, we could have done a deep dive into any one of these particular subjects, environmental, health, sort of societal impacts of our food system. We wanted this to be an introductory course, which is actually very applicable to this conversation today because we wanted people, first and foremost, to ask questions about where their food comes from, realizing that we can't tell them everything about every product, but we can inspire them to be curious. We can inspire them to recognize that there is a big food landscape, the different ways that various foods are grown impact the environment in very different ways, and that we need to transition and switch to a fully regenerative food system. Per Clark's point, and that's why I'm so excited, to, that's why I'm so excited to, to be invited here today, is because I believe deeply that there is a huge knowledge gap 
and therefore a huge storytelling opportunity between all of the amazing work being done in the regenerative aquaculture and aquaculture space and what most consumers understand or appreciate. There is definitely a considerable amount of people who care about sustainability, and there's definitely a lot of people who care about health. In our work, we found that people tend to care about health first and then sustainability second, which is fine because it affects your body first, I get that. We also found on land that the healthiest, most the healthiest foods for our bodies are coming from the most sustainable regenerative farms as well. So we're trying to draw this connection between human health and planetary health. And I think there is a huge opportunity to tell powerful stories here. What we do and we specialize in, we, we've visited 60 farms all over the world in the past couple years to interview farmers about the future of food. And we have found that farmers, as I'm sure many of you know and have had the opportunity to interact with them, or if, you, if you're not yourselves, farmers are these incredibly inspiring individuals that are not seen as being left or right. They're, being, they're seen as wanting to do the right thing and feeding people. And we have found them to be incredible communicators. And we've been working with a lot of our clients to create transparency in the supply chain and go directly to the source and tell the stories about the farmers and hear from them why they want to use regenerative feed, why they are so proud of what they're doing, and found a lot of success in communicating that to the consumer. And when the consumer says, hey, I, I can visually see where this farm is, what's going on, I can support that. And I think that's what Seatopia has seen a lot of success in. I mean, I think eventually, every time you get you know, a piece of fish, there should be a QR code that brings you to a 30 second video about where it came from, how it was grown, what went into it. And I think that's the future of transparency. But there's a huge, huge opportunity here uh, to, like Clark said, to not make the mistake that the agriculture business did. And we can, we can leap forward, you know, two decades in terms of storytelling uh, if we get it right. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. We are doing that now. There are QR codes on the fillets. They go to dedicated farm page talking about practices. And I think that's what's, what's played a huge role there as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, you know, Maisie, your book is, is really good, and it is really practical. I really Thank like you. it. And one thing that I noticed about it is that you're very open about mistakes that you have made. And I feel like you, you discussed the mistake and then how you pivoted and what you learned. If you'd share maybe that story. Well, there's many mistakes that I've made along the way, I'll tell you that. Um, but I think that the one that Victoria and I talked a little bit about before the session was our initial marketing program of our sustainability initiatives. And it was called Circle of Responsibility. And we had an, a, a mission statement that we wrote for it that uh, we take a macro view of wellness and a healthy community environment and menu are all vital to the well-being of our guests. And then we created a board that we put at the entrance of a cafe with that statement and it said circle of responsibility with a beautiful logo and it had a whole bunch of commitments listed on it and then we had brochures for community environment and menu that explained all of these issues. And I did focus groups and we were not real often did we do focus groups at Bon Appetit. We sort of moved quickly and did things on our gut, which was our strength in many ways, but sometimes we slowed down. And I did focus groups and I said at a, a corporate account, um, are you interested in these issues? And everybody said, yes, 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 I'm interested. And oh, do you care about it? Yes, 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 I care about it. Would you like to learn? Yes, I'd like to learn. And then I said, did you see the board? And people went, huh? And I said, that big board at the entrance to the cafe, and it has the big, beautiful logo on it. And, and uh, somebody said, oh, I saw that, but I didn't want to read it because it said responsibility. And I'm already responsible for enough. <laughs> And so they saw all of my beautiful bullet points about what we were doing as something that I was asking them to be responsible for. Um, and as we kept going in that conversation, somebody said to me, you know, it's really about knowing what you're eating. And I was like, oh, that's what people want to know. They want to know what they're eating. And so the next version of the board said, know what you're eating on the top of it. And more people read it. But still, I never had to reprint the brochures because nobody took them. 
<laughs> so we never went through enough to have to reprint them. <laughs> and um, while that was great from a cost savings perspective, it wasn't real effective in communicating my message. And so over the many years, we kept distilling it down smaller and smaller and smaller until we wound up with these banners at the entrances of the cafes that that had a beautiful image and then said something really sort of obtuse and broad <laughs> about the beauty of local food or something without all of the messaging that I cared about. And I think one of the dangers as I sit and listen to these, these sessions here today, and I'm learning so much and I'm into it, and I think we are all into it, is that we can fall in love with our story and our science because it is our life's work. And that doesn't mean that that our customers, whoever your customer is, maybe it's a B2B customer or a B2C customer, um, has as much patience for the story. And so I think it's fantastic when you talk about like beautiful storytelling. Um, also the time and place of the storytelling. I was trying to tell this really long story as people were walking into a cafe. That is not where they wanna stop and learn, right? So maybe it's when you're on the couch and you've got some time and you make the choice. Or we found having events where you prepared people that when they come to the cafe, you already know ahead of time there's going to be something special happening there and they make more time in their schedule or more importantly just come with the mindset that they're going to listen and learn because um, they're not just there to get lunch or to have that break from their day um, so those are I mean I could talk for hours about all the mistakes I've made but those are some of them <laughs> that that's such a great story I really enjoyed it in the in the book um, at Vera Morris, we're working with a farming partner in Chile who is uh, who are raising steelhead trout, and working with, not telling them what to do, believe me. But they have created a brand called Algae and Insects. And when when he first showed that to me, I was like, Oh my God, we're going to put that on on the shopping. Uh, nobody's going to buy it. They're going to freak out. But there, what uh, I think it, it, we're seeing is that it's an attention grabber, and they didn't just make, they didn't just grow, you know, grow some steelhead and put it in a package. But they also developed a digital um, package to go with it, so that the retailer, whoever it is, will be able to tell the story. They're doing some really nice things, like like you're doing, like planting. Uh, kelp. Uh, they're, they're doing things, and so they're delivering not just fish, not just fish in a skin pack, but fish in a skin pack with branding, with storytelling, and assets that the, that the retailer can ultimately use. And, and I'm wondering, I'm, I'm going to go to you, Mike, and, and like, what, what could some of the producers or some of the different, you know, participants in the, in the value chain provide you? to tell your story better? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think the, you know, one, one thing to keep in mind is it's a, it's a funnel. Uh, you know, there's, there's lots of folks uh, out, out there at the top and, you know, slowly, uh, you, you know, that, that falls off. Uh, Pretty quickly, it, it falls off uh, by the time you get to the number of folks that are, are ready to make a purchase. And at, at each stage of that funnel, you really have, you know, maybe five seconds, you know, 10 if you're lucky to, to get whatever message it is uh, a, across uh, to that person and just try to get them, you know, one step uh, f further down that, that funnel. And so, uh, in my mind, you know, it's about meeting meeting the customers, uh, you know, where they are today, and you know, I, I think where most folks are today is you know starting to understand uh, some of the different certifying agencies, you know, whether that's uh, you know the red, yellow, green, or you know, does it have that MSC you know certification mark on it? Uh, and so, you know, some of I think some of the opportunities can come by. Uh, helping to expand upon uh, where feed fits into some of those, uh, into some of those ratings. Uh, you know, the, the other thing uh, I might think about is, what, what is that headline that uh, kind of to the algae and insects example can really grab somebody's attention? You know, is it 
uh, you know, is it you saved or, you know, we've saved, uh, you know, 2,000 tons of, of wild krill, you know, this past month. Uh, but, but something that, you know, really grabs that customer's attention, uh, you know, quickly without them having to think, you know, too much about it. Uh, and then from there, you'll, you'll get the folks who are real advocates and, and really passionate about it to, you know, double click and, uh, and learn more. Well, Clark, uh, Seatopia is the first uh, retailer in the U.S. that's going to actually be using this brand. Just was uh, introduced at, at Sina, And so I, I remember your reaction. Maybe you want to talk about how, how you felt when you saw it at first. I mean, we're thrilled about this partnership because this is exactly what we're, what we're looking for. Um, Seatopia was, was engaged pretty early on at, at the inception of this partnership, which is fantastic. And we told Coletta Bay that th this may not be the highest margin product that you're going to do. We understand this is a risk, but we want to buy this. And not only do we want to buy this, we want to use, use that brand megaphone that we have through this network of people talking about it to explain in the States why this is something we should care about. Today, we're literally running ads about insect and algae now. So we have to do that. Um, that said, when I saw the packaging, I was like, this is ambitious. <laughs> it says uh, algae and insects, you know, right on the front. And I think, you know, I agree with Mike. There's a there's a, a few different levels of consumers in terms of where they are on the funnel. I mean, this is really difficult. Don't get me wrong. We get a lot of emails from people like, wait, this is farmed. I, I thought farm fish was bad, you know? And then we have people that are like asking specific questions around density and they're asking, they are asking specific questions around feed. And, and when we can give them those answers and when we can answer where and how, where is it from? How is it farmed? Where is it from? How is it farmed? Yeah. What did it eat? We need to be able to answer those questions. It, if we can't, we're, we're never going to get to where we're trying to go, and that's exactly what we need. Um, and Coletta Bay is a perfect example of how we can do that with a very clear label. Yeah. There are two ingredients, and they make perfect sense. They make perfect sense to people, and it makes perfect sense for the fish. You know, it works. And that's something that it's very easy for us um, to communicate and, and help move this along. So Maisie, we talked about this a, l a little bit it, because it, it seems like to me, after I got over the, the name of it, um, it, it seemed like we needed to educate. And so we talked about events and, and how, uh, t talk to me about how effective those are and maybe, maybe how you do it. How, how I, I think events, as I mentioned, are really important because they put people in a different frame of mind and get them ready to stop and listen and learn and when we're all moving so quickly. I think also we need to be sure that the event is a good news event and so much of what we talk about in seafood is a bad news and then we have a solution and and I went down this path myself again more of my mistakes of I created what I wound up calling the sky is falling marketing which is like I have to explain all these horrible things that are happening in the world so then you'll feel better that I'm not doing them or that I'm doing them less and it's a real bummer and with seafood in particular, what I have found is that the more we talk about the negative things, even if we've got this like glimmer of a solution, more than any other food, consumers are, are, in, are willing to opt out to just say, oh, I just won't eat fish. I mean, you mentioned that we eat less fish in the US already, I think. Um, and part of us putting out messaging that things are bad is going to just destroy our market base as opposed to move them into better solutions or into paying more. Some percent will, but some just say, all farmed must be bad. It's too complicated, I don't wanna know. And so I think having an event that's around something positive that people feel good about and can celebrate can help relieve some of that stress in the decision making and maybe not um, introducing new concepts that make people feel bad, but taking the things they already know, like the red, yellow, green, or if there has been a big expose, like Outlaw Oceans or something, or you know another film, and then showing how your product is the solution to that, not introducing new problems to people. Oliver, I, I feel like your film is, is 
is kind of doing exactly what what Maisie's talking about. Um, it, it didn't it didn't point. This is bad. This is bad. I mean, I have to confess there have been so many criticisms about aquaculture that is like, oh well, and I want you to meet this chef, and he's just done a new film, and I'm like, oh, film. What? what how, how could that be? But you didn't, you didn't do that, and and I know that you focused on terrestrial farming and, and things like that in this particular film, but but how how did you do that? How did you create such a balanced storytelling? That's a great question. Uh, from the very beginning, you know, we realized that a lot of the, the majority of the storytelling out there was very doom and gloom, and we were just frankly tired of it, and we realized that the only way to get people off their asses and to actually change is to tell stories of hope. And not just hope, but at, like tangible, practical solutions. And that's what we focused on in our film. We said, yes, there are a lot of problems. We're not gonna not talk about them. We're not gonna pretend like they don't exist. We are going to explicitly discuss them and talk about them. So that, per your point, Victoria, when we show you the solutions, you understand the context, but you understand that, hey, it's not necessarily some faraway tech thing that we don't have the answer to yet. We have so many of the solutions already. That's what we discovered in our film, and that's what I'm hearing today. And from what I know about regenerative aquaculture, we have so many of the solutions already, and we need to change the paradigm from a storytelling perspective. And the food world, uh, the on-land food world, uh, has been doing a good job at this. And what we really tried to do in the film was say, hey, look, look at these examples. We know how to restore and regenerate farmland through regenerative principles. We know how to look holistically at health through building hospital farms on hospitals with you know, farmers markets in the hospital lobby and treating patients who have chronic disease. We already have working examples of how to do this. We need systemic awareness amongst the population and we need policy help. We need a movement of change. But it starts with showing people examples and showing people that there are hardworking, incredible people around the world, in this country and around the world, who are already you know, champion, championing uh, working examples, showing them that they exist, you know, painting a new picture of what the world can look like. And that's our job as filmmakers, that's our job as storytellers, that's our job as authors, is to paint a new vision of the world. We can't just keep fighting the old, we have to build what's new, and our job at the top of the funnel as a production company is to highlight the innovators and to connect those innovations to regular people in a way where people say, I wanna be part of that. That looks fun, that looks delicious, that looks sustainable. That looks like a better version of what the world can be. And we wanna be part of that. So we need to paint a better, visually, optically, we need to paint a more compelling narrative, a more beautiful image of a more sustainable world, visually. And we create that in the minds of consumers. Uh, that's excellent, uh, and and thank you for saying hope. We saw earlier today the the trailer for the new project, Hope in the Water. So we are all gonna. I hope we can all get behind that and support that and put that out on our social media feeds and all that. Um, and and I think Clark, I, I would like to go to you because I think that leads right into your influencer network. One thing that I get when I when I look at your Instagram and I see like Chef Oliver, I, I see these people speaking about the products that you have. It's authentic. It's really coming from their heart. They really believe in that. Can you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, the first thing I said was that they, they are customers, but the second thing is that we know so much more now in social media is that authenticity is the most important thing. It's, it's very easy now to to tell those authentic stories because of what is going on and because of, again, like the blueprint that we have in, in agriculture. Um, you know, I spent some time in the, in the culinary world as well, and restaurants also do a really good job of explicitly connecting a thing to time and place. And even when you look at what agriculture has done with ecotourism, I mean, why is that not something that we're doing in, in aquaculture? Why are we not bringing these networks and bringing these people and bringing filmmakers and storytellers out to farms to show what you know, the early stages or the full-blown operations of an integrated multitrophic system can look like? Because now they have the lexicon to understand what that is. It's just one less hurdle we have to climb over. Um, so I think if there ever was a time, the time is now, and using all the megaphones that we have 
is a good way to, to start making more progress faster. That's excellent. I, I think one thing that we know uh, is that we need to give the downstream partners that we have some tools to use, some storytelling, uh, sure, about us, but I think, Maisie, in your book, um, y you, you talk about empathy and not, I mean, many of us, the, the things that we're doing, the things that were done in, in, in Nebraska to, to scale up Veramaris were really hard and, and expensive. And, and so you get caught up in that. And, and, and look what I did. Look, I, I made this happen. But really, what does that do for me as the shopper? How does that help me with the future of food, like you're talking about? How, how am I, how's my dinner tonight going to help my grandchild someday have food? Or, you know, tell me a, a story. But we, we have to give that to them. We, I, we can't, and this is just obviously my opinion, we can't just expect them to come up with this. However, Macy, you did come up with it. And how were you able to, to get that empathy and put, and put the customer in the middle? Well, we did it with a variety of messages to a variety of people. And I think you've heard that already several times on the panel about the funnel and where you, where you intersect it. One of the best things I ever did from a marketing perspective was create what we called the Bon Appetit Management Company Fellows. And it was hiring recent college grads from schools that we served that had been student activists on their campuses. So they might have been the ones that were the most troublemaking to us, that had the most requests and the most questions. Um, they were the rabble rousers. And I hired them for a year or two, it was an option for a second year renewal, to travel the country and speak to other students about sustainable food systems. And the Bon Appetit message was baked into that, but not the primary piece. And it was a peer to peer, education where it's a very different conversation if somebody's saying, I was in your seat last year. I sat in a school where Bon Appetit served me versus me who was like the face of the corporation and of course was going to lie to you, right? Because I'm like the man. Um, so I feel like I'm the man? How did I become the man? But I am, it turns out. <laughs> And um, these students, so I would bring them in and, and they had to spend um, several months learning all of our stories and stuff and then they, the fellows would give the speech to me uh, and it's the worst tryout ever to tell somebody the origin story of all the things that they created. Um, and always the students first time, the, the fellows first time, they would tell this really beautiful story of everything being perfect. And I would say, no, no, tell the real story. Tell about how I screwed up or tell about when you were a student and you went to talk to your chef in the cafe and the chef blew you off. And then you tried again and they blew you off again. And the third time they had the conversation really. So it goes back to that authenticity and the reality um, and really trying to sit in somebody's shoes. And they had those conversations in classes where they were, again, people are primed to listen or at student, at student meetings. It turns out a lot of student groups meet at like 9 p.m. I never would go to a 9 p.m. meeting. But if I pay young people, they will go to 9 p.m. meetings. Um, and then again, boiling it down to other people, some people just got a message that say like, fresh, local, seasonal, which you know for me would be like, WTF, what does that mean? Um, but for some people, that's all they can grok. That's all that they're ready to take on. So having the empathy of the, of the person sitting, what, what problem are you solving for them? And what are they ready to hear? Excellent. Uh, so, so that leads me to the demographic question that we, we talked about a little bit, Mike. And I, I kind of like to know, like, how, how is your e-commerce um, business connecting on the demographic sort of segmentation? Uh, yeah, so, you know, for us uh, being uh, based in the Northeast, you know, that's where uh, we, we have a lot of awareness, but, you know, nationwide, uh, you know, we, we do benefit from uh, having this historic uh, historic brand. So nationwide, there's probably about a third of the country uh, that, that's familiar with us. Um, and, you know, that, 
is mostly split uh, across the population centers in terms of you know where we're doing most of our business, and it's uh, you know slightly more geared towards uh, the the Northeast. Uh, we do target uh, higher end you know clientele, so you know, I would say households that are a uh, hundred thousand plus, uh, and it's about evenly split uh, between male and female. Uh, you know we're looking mostly you know I would say thirty five plus. Uh, so, you know, a lot, a lot of details there, but that's, that's a bit about the, uh, the, the demographics and, you know, folks that are, you know, maybe, uh, a little less numbers, just, you know, folks that want and appreciate and, and love great food. Uh, that, that's really what, what we're targeting with our, uh, with our messaging. Thanks. Uh, I'm curious, your, your film hasn't been out that long, a month now? Two months. Two months. Are are you getting some demo? You get you getting some some data back? Is is um, Apple TV sharing with you who's watching? And I've not I've not gotten the full scoop yet from our, our distributor Gravitas, but I'll I'll keep you up I'll keep you updated when I get it. <laughs> I, I thought I would ask. It's it's always kind of a black box. But we did launch on three inter or six international airlines that have started this month, oh, which is fantastic. pretty cool. Congratulations! I also don't have the information on that, so I can't share that. With you. Um, what about feedback? What what are you hearing? I think that this is a moment and a movement whose time has come. I think all around the country and all around the world, there is a waking up to the macro challenges, the existential challenges facing our food system, from climate change to wars to, you know, you name it. And there is an understanding that we need to shift things a little bit. We need a new paradigm. And we've seen this in the on-land agriculture world in the past, you know, 10, 15 years, the awareness has really started to change. And I think the significant influx of documentaries has been really, really helpful for the movement. And I think the aquaculture and the fish, the, this, this movement right now is at a really pivotal and potentially powerful moment in this crux of awareness and also the scale and scope of the solutions that can exist. And so I implore you to think about storytelling. I implore you to think about really investing in cr controlling your narrative, whatever, whatever that, wherever that may be in the value chain, connecting to your consumers. One of the, well, some of the things that were spoken about today was how do you connect to your consumers? And we found a shift in our business. We used to do a lot of like two, three, five minute sort of hero videos. Now we're doing that as well, but we're cutting and we're getting requests to do a lot more 30 to 45 second, 50 second reels for Instagram that our clients are then targeting, using targeted ads for Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, you name it. And they are seeing a lot of success because they are able to target direct, for not a lot of money, they're able to target direct to their consumers a super targeted message that tells the story about their product, where it came from, how it was farmed, why it was farmed in this way, and how it impacts both human and environmental health. And we've seen a lot of success there. So as this movement continues to grow, and we're in a very exciting phase, I just invite you to think about storytelling and really build that into your model as an essential part because there's a knowledge gap. And if we in this room don't fill it with the right kind of stuff, someone else is gonna fill it with the other narrative. And we don't have time for that. Right, because people are interested. And, and Clark, I'm, I'm thinking of the most recent ads that I've seen for Seatopia. And honestly, I thought I was looking at Instagram because in the, your Insta kind of fed into to your ads. And, and so that is, is truly authentic. I, and that, that, was just a, that was just a prop. I was trying well, to... Well, um... Our Satopia founder is a, has, a, has a strong creative direction there that's really worked well and I think comes off as authentically as it is, which is really great. And, yeah. and there's some best practices there around how to do you know, ads on social and all that stuff I think is, is, is well discovered, but it has to be authentic and it has to be true. Um, it really helps when the nutrition side of it is there, right? Leading with sustainability and why this is better is something that should be done. It's been tried. It, it, it works to an extent, but when you can quantify through third-party you know, analysis, not just us saying it, that it's demonstrably more nutritious and better for people, 
um, you're going to move the needle a lot, a lot faster. And that's something that we really need to focus on. You know, we've talked a lot about farms and feed and, and nutrients and supplements in this conference. And it's like, from the consumer perspective, it's like, yes, what we hear from them is like, yes, but then what does this do to the end product? What are the omega-3 to omega-6 ratios? What is the nutrient density? What is the bioavailability? How is this better for me? And then show me that's the case, you know? And if we can prove it, which I really think we can with all the work that's been done in this room, then let's do that. And so us as a buyer, you know, us as a storyteller, where are those farms? I mean, who, who wants to take those risks and do that? Let us come help be that megaphone. You know, um, I was talking to Joe and Adam last night, like if you guys are doing a trial of something and you can come and say, hey, I've got 500 pounds of zero marine protein, no corn, no soy, and here's the feed makeup, what do you think? We'll buy it. And then we'll get the feedback from people and then use a megaphone to talk about why this is the future. And, and that's, I think, what we need to do. Can I jump in? Yeah. yeah. I, I totally agree with, with what Clark is saying. I want to add a different perspective from a different marketplace as well. So not to, to counteract, to add to. And that is in the broader market where we're not talking about these highly educated, highly interested premium customers. Um, when we're talking about the broader marketplace, and we talk about feed, you're really talking about a B2B sale, right? And, and basically the only thing that I think that the broad marketplace is going to stay committed to, and I'd say loosely committed to, are their climate change commitments. All of the major food companies all the major companies, period, have made these sweeping net zero commitments, 2030, 2050. No one knows how they're getting there. And most are not on track to get there, much less even to know how they're going to measure it, much less get there. But it all lies in their scope three. And that's where you come in. And so that's if you're talking about the broad market, that's where I would lean into is this feed issue is going to help solve your climate change commitment problem. That's the only problem they've got. That's the one the SEC cares about. That's where I would lean in. Yeah, I would just second that and also what Clark said. We've seen this, I think, from a, from a communication. We've had success from a communications perspective, from a documentary production perspective, in drawing that, and Clark absolutely said it, and I think I said this earlier, people do care about the environment, they re but they really care about health first. And I tried to shoehorn the other way and it just didn't work. Um, but drawing a connection, an, intercon an interconnection between health and environmental health is a winning argument, and I think it is a, a, a cornerstone of the food movement that we all need to cherish and celebrate in our own way. Because once we promote and celebrate and cherish human health, we are also, not accidentally, but in addition to, we are also supporting environmental health. So focusing on personal health is a good way for us to also deal with the bigger environmental issue. Um, yeah. And if you can get even more specific and do your kids' health. Yes, yes, yes. The big winner. Bingo. Thank you. Um, we're, we're out of time, but thank you, panel, FultonFishMarket.com, Maisie Gansler. Here's her book. You can't, you can't market manure at lunchtime. I love this title. Cetopia.fish and Oliver, Feeding Tomorrow. FeedingTomorrowFilms.com and our production company is Common Table Creative. Thank you, all of you. <laughs>